Look in your Bibles if you have one, and if you don't, we'll put it up on the screen for you. That way you'll know we're reading out of the Word of God. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to start in verse number 14. It's always wonderful to have a part of the Big Springs Church here in our services. God bless y'all so much for coming and being with us this evening. Amen. Here we are in Genesis chapter 6. We're going to start in verse number 14. We'll read down through verse 22. We have other visitors. We're so proud to have y'all also in our services. May God bless you for being here today. In the name of Jesus. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without. But he told the Lord, it only needs it on the outside. Oh, oh, he didn't say nothing, did he? Okay. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubics. The breadth of it, 50 cubics. The height of it, 30 cubics. A window shalt thou make to the ark and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with how many stories under it? The second and third story shalt thou make it. Wow, that's a pretty good sized boat. <clears throat> and behold, I, even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. How many ever heard of the judgment hand of God? It happened in chapter 7. Wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou, thy sons, and thy wife... But leave their wives out there. No, the Lord don't break up families. That's the devil. Yeah. Get your wives, your wife and your son's wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort. Boy, I'm glad them horses got on there. Shalt thou bring into the ark. <laughs> To keep them alive with thee, we could have done without some of them, but not the horses. <laughs> they shall be male and female. <clears throat> and every living thing of all flesh, okay, of the fowls after their kind and of the cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. So the Lord loves the people and he loves the animals. The animals. Yeah. He made them, he loves them. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten. So they got their John Deere baler and come on now. Can you imagine how much time it took to gather up that much grass and uh, oats and wheat and all that, enough for the animals and enough for them? Take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten and thou shalt gather it to thee and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Now, can you imagine a, a big old wooden barrel full of red ants? You never heard about an ant eater? If you get food for them, what are you going to feed them if you don't catch some ants? Said everything they eat, we need to get it on that boat. Don't let them get loose at night. You'd be in trouble. (laughs) You know what the bats eat? Mosquitoes. Yeah. Are y'all still here? (laughs) Okay. I can see y'all are not with me. Y'all just out there somewhere like, well, it just floated off somewhere. Well, there was a lot. There was a lot of stuff happened. Take... (laughs) And take thou unto thee of all food that's eaten. That's lots of taking. Wow. 
Thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. So they got a big rack of bananas. This is just for the monkeys. <laughs> wow. Ain't nobody like God, is there? Isn't he incredible? <clears throat> and uh, Noah said, too big an order for me. Do, do you see how we diminish God and his saying? I, I think this is an awesome scripture. Thus, can you read that? Thus did Noah. He did what God said. Woo! I guess he just told the animals, you can just eat hay for seven months. I don't think so. He said, whatever they eat, get some of it for them. And I'm sure they was thin when they got off. They said, ain't a day for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thus did Noah according to what? All. All that God commanded him. So did he. Lord, thank you for your word. We praise you. Lord, that there's nothing left behind in all your doings. Lord, just the body you made for us is so incredible. And beyond that, when we go to looking around, Lord, you're infinite. We think we've got this whole thing in a, in a nutshell, and we, we can't even scratch the outside of the real surface of what's out there. And we thank you for being God and letting us in through the shed blood of your precious son, Jesus. Lord, touch us tonight. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. Now, in our Sunday school class this morning, they come out with gloves and said... <laughs> You're going to have to, if you're going to live for God, you've got to work for God. How many's ever sang this song? We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work. Yeah. And that's not just physical work. That's like we want to work for the Lord till he comes. We want to help him. Help him. We're part of the gathering. We're the harvest team. Wow. Man, if your tractor is sitting on the road, fill it up with diesel Let's go. We need to gather the, the hay and the cotton and, yeah, everything. And this, this morning I was uh, talking to him about climbing the mountain. And so you got, that's, that's hard work. Uh, ask Brother Clay. I was telling him what you told us about climbing the mountain. You got up to nearly to the top. He said, as far as I'm going, I, it ain't that I can't go. I just ain't pushing myself no more. And then he told us Friday night, he said, I should have climbed on up there because I mean, is it not that far? It was a long ways when you're tired, but he's still, he's thinking back now, I should have done it better. And so when you think about working for God, don't leave that for aftermath. Do whatever you want to do for God. When? Right now. Right now. Right now. Right. Noah did all that the Lord spake unto him. Wow, that's, that's amazing. It, it may, can you imagine enough fish for those eagles? How many knows that there's eagles that are fishing eagles? Yeah. yeah. So they get to fly through the ark, you know, it's 300 something foot long or 400, and wham, they catch one of them fish out of that barrel, come back up and say, okay. <clears throat> so I want to talk to you just a little bit this evening about covenanting with God for your family. It's not uncommon in today's world for your word to be worth nothing. <clears throat> It's a, such a sad time. I was raised around people. They could sell a whole farm or ranch, shake hands on it. And if somebody in 30 minutes asked them, offered them a, a half a million dollars more, it, was, it wasn't theirs any longer. They had, already, they had already said with their word that I'm going to take this amount for it. That's pretty awesome. But today's deal, people chicken out pretty easy. And the word's not important. And the Lord said that a man's word, it was better to have a good name than to have great riches. Build on your name. Build on your family. So I want to talk to you out of verse number 18. Covenanting with God for your family. Very probably, if your family goes to heaven, you're going to have something to do with it. And if they don't, there's a good chance that you kept, that you kept them 
away from God. Not that you just said, I just don't want God, but your actions, your busyness, your time spent somewhere else left no place for God. And so your children grow up not knowing the Lord God of all flesh. And so what I want to talk to you about is covenanting with your with God for your family. Covenant, a covenant is a holy agreement. And this is the first thing that has to happen if you make a covenant with God. There must be participation. Would you say it with me? There must be participation. If you're going to lead your family for the Lord, there must be participation. Participation is required. That's what a covenant is all about. God does his part, you do your part. The Lord says, you, sir, bring them up in the way they ought to go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Isn't that a wonderful promise? That's not a slam against us. That's a gold. That's a drive on up, do what you can for Jesus. And so in in this passage here, he's talking to us about participation. And this is a participation in the work place. Building an ark, if I understand right, a cubic is about 16 to 18 inches long. If it's 18 inches and it was 300 cubics, how long would the ark be? If 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 it was 18 inches, well, that would be a foot and a half. And so if if he said 300 cubits, that would be 450 foot long. If he said 50 cubits wide, that would be 75 foot wide. And if he said 30 cubits high, that would be 45 foot high. That's a big structure. And for them to build that without electricity was awesome. Wow. And we're talking about almost 4,000 years ago when God spoke to Noah and said, I want you to do something. I want you to build an ark. That's incredible. Go back to verse number 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark and shalt pitch it within and without. And so this is a big order. It didn't happen in a day. It didn't happen in a month. It didn't happen in a year. It didn't happen in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. The Bible says while the ark was a preparing. We're talking like a hundred years before all of this come together. That's what the Bible says. Genesis 5 says he was 500 years old when he had... Can you name them? Ham, Shem, and Japheth. He's 600 years in chapter 7 when the flood came. That's a lot of nail driving. You've never seen so many hammers with, with uh, broken handles and so many bent nails. <laughs> How many of you can drive a nail without bending it? <laughs> That's, I shot horses since I was just a young man. And uh, if them little old nails are flimsy. And so you got to have a light hammer, like a 12-ounce hammer. That's what I use. And you just do like that, just a little. If you don't, if you ever hit it with a heavy, it just bend over and say, oh, I don't care. <laughs> and so you're driving, you're driving them nails into that gopher wood. Man, that's lots of Armstrong. None of that. Don't you like them little old nailers? Pop, pop. Boy, can you imagine what they, if you could have got them an electric saw back then or one of them just shove a battery in there and go, wow. But every bit of it was by hand and the covenant was for one reason. It was for the saving of their family. He said, if you participate with me, I'm going to get you out of here. Whoa, that's powerful. Now, I don't know, it's been, it's been several years ago, probably three or four years ago. But Rebecca come by the house one day and I was, I was taking down some electric fence and we just put up a five wire fence just right there just west of our house and I was working on my pens and stuff and I was out there by myself taking down some electric fence and uh, she drives up and she's got Randy's little grandson with her, uh, Kason. And uh, whenever he looked out there and I was working, he said, I'm, I'm staying with Uncle Danny. 
And so five years old, he bails out. He got him his gloves. I mean, he bails out. He goes to picking up stuff and <laughs> helping around there. I, I mean, five-year-old, you say, that wants to build fields. I said, come on. So we worked around there about an hour and a half, something like that. I mean, he's sweating worse now. I mean, little old chunky boy. He is so much fun. I mean, it is, I just laughing all the time, you know. Anyway, I said, now, Kaysen, you stay right here. I said, I got to go over this electric fence and go get some stuff out of my welder and, and come back around here with some pliers and stuff to, to get these wires off. And so he didn't ever say nothing. And I thought he would listen, you know, but you know, we're hard headed. <laughs> so anyway, I stepped over the electric fence while well, I looked back and I heard, uh, 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 uh. And he had got a hold of that electric fence and pushed it down. And his legs is about that long. He pushed that fence down and stepped over. He goes, oh, oh. <laughs> not a cry or nothing. Man, here he come right to me. And he's going to help me carry the stuff back, the hammer and stuff we needed. Well, we, we got back and I thought, surely I did not. I didn't see that right. And so he comes right back and gets a hold of that fence and step back over. <laughs> He got it out there, about it far from me to Con, and he said, he, he said, he looked at that fence, and he looked at me, and he said, hey. He said, that, that thing bit me twice. Let me tell you something. If you're willing to go through an electric fence to help somebody do something, you want to participate real bad. Most people, if the sweat ever starts, they're through. Brother, this, this gopher wood ark was a labor of love because he wanted to do what God said. And if your family makes it to heaven, you're going to have to put your spiritual gloves on. You're going to have to fight the devil. You're going to have to spend some time on your knees. Come on, somebody. Help me now. Don't you want your children to go to heaven and your grandchildren and your children? Yes. Why not reach out and say, God, help me to help them. I'm willing... I don't know if I'm willing to go over the electric fence or not, but I do want to participate, don't you? Yeah. Woo. That's so precious to know that God in our spirit, we want to follow what you. The word participation means the action. Are you out there? Participation means action. It don't mean you just sit there through the whole deal. I'm not just talking about church service. I'm talking about time when you could pray together. Times when you could uh, stop and say, let's, let's get us a Bible verse. Time when somebody in your family is, is struggling and say, you know what, let's, let's believe God for them. You, you can do that, sir and ma'am. You can reach out and say, you know what, we're, we're going to help. We want to be part of this covenant that God has made with humanity. He loves people. You're not a cast off to him. When he looks at you, he says, you can do it. You can be better. You can be an overcomer. And he leads us out. And I, I was thinking as Brother Freeman was reading that stuff, I've, I've done a lot of that stuff. It's horrible uh, as, as far as sin. I know what it is to go to church and, and, and not leave there, but the next week be in the honky tonk. I'm not proud of that. I am so sad that I was raised right, but I was still, come and see, I'm a chueco. I was crooked, wasn't straight. When I got straight, I ain't been back to the honky-tonk. I go to church now because I love Jesus. Whoa, I, I want to see my kids make it. Yeah, my family, my family's family. So there's got to be some input, some participation. Make the an ark of gopher wood. So he's saying, get on your work clothes. <laughs> Woo! They come by here today. There was a main line broke right out here. I thought it was ours. Sid and Rebecca run up here and, and they cut the water off and I checked it and, and it didn't stop. That. I mean, that's running out there like crazy. And so finally I called the sheriff department and they, uh, they sent a guy with one of those. The first time I've seen it in action, but they sent one of those kind of to wash it, wash it around it. Then it sucks the water out. That thing was running so fast. They got a load, a thousand gallon load and just a little bit had to go dump it. They come back and sucked it up again, had to go dump it. I mean, they're on the third, on the third load. That, that's how much water's coming out of there. They're trying to keep it sucked down till they could put the clamp on it. Anyway, they, they're working. I mean, the sweat running down their face. They got mud all over their legs 
Come on now. The shovel ain't just up there like Lena. How many knows the shovel's supposed to be? Yeah, that's not to lean on. <laughs> well, spiritually, friends, our life is the same way. This Bible is not just to pitch up on the dash of your car where somebody can see it. That thing ought to be wore plumb out from you toting it around. Yes, there should be some of them old songs of Zion that rises up in your spirit while you're taking a shower and you're just sitting there thanking God and your kids say, man alive. <laughs> what, what happened? Isn't that better than singing the old honky tonk song? Help me now. I'm talking about making a covenant with your family. I want them to go to heaven and for that to happen, I must participate. Now, Noah at this time is, is doing the impossible at a very time when the world was so terribly lost. Look at chapter 6 and verse number 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that, that every imagination of the thoughts of, of his heart, of man's heart, was only what? Evil, Evil continually. What I love about Noah, as wicked as the world was, and there was not a, another man besides his children that believed in what he was doing. And so, friends, don't give up just because you look around and people say, hey, you must be a little bit whacked out. You're too holy for earthly good. Well, drive on up. Go ahead and live for God. Don't let nothing break you down. Say, I'm participating in getting my family to the portals of glory. I've made a covenant with God. It's a holy agreement that, Lord, I want to raise them in a way that they'll make it all the way to heaven. Noah is so out of touch with the world and its agenda, but single-minded to fulfill the call of God. Woo! Don't we need to head down that road? I don't care what they're playing or what they're singing or what their dance hall is like or how fast they can run on the horse or in the ballpark. I want to know if my family's right with God. I want them to go to heaven because I really believe Jesus is coming back for a church and only those that know Christ are going to heaven. He said, well, I don't care. You will care. Did you know the rich man that never cared about God, he's just barely in hell and he cries out in Luke 16, send the man with some water just to drop. And then when he said, we can't get to you, he said, would you do this? Send Lazarus back that he might speak to my five brothers. They're just like I am. They got so much money, they don't have time for God. Send somebody from the grave to evangelize them lest they come to this horrible place. And Abraham said, Sir, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they wouldn't hear Lazarus, though he rose from the dead. You know who might get to them? You're still alive. You might talk your family into the righteousness of Christ. And here's why. There is a mental equilibrium in the human body put there by God. Just because the whole world is going crooked doesn't mean people don't know better. Don't you believe that for one ounce? I preached to a whole bunch of guys in the jail today, and I asked one of the boys that was standing right up against the, the bars. I said, how would your life be if you had put as much time into living for God as you have living for the devil? He said, I wouldn't be in jail. You know why? You know why he could say that? Because that equilibrium is the knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. I don't care. Look at, look at Noah. Even though everybody in the world besides him went to hell. Him and his family. Friends, that may not mean nothing to you, but you cannot read Hebrews chapter 11 and like verse 6 or 7, something like that. The Bible says everybody he didn't save, he condemned them. And the reason he condemned them is because he said, I owe my life to Jesus. I'm making no covenant with sin. I am going to build that ark. And if I die, if I die, I'm, I'm going to get her done. I'm going to build the ark like the Lord said. And you say, preacher, you're way too rough. Friends, how important is it to go to heaven? What are you willing to wager on? Or, or to make a, a, you think you're just going to go up and get you a scratch off? Say, well, I hope I, I hope I make it in. If you're scratching off, you probably ain't going anyway. Yeah. The Lord didn't call us. Come on, help me. 
He didn't call us to wine and dine the world. He called us to do right, to put our faith in God. We belong to somebody. His name is Jesus. I'm not out there saying if I can win something from the world, I want to win the world to Jesus. Yes. I love what one writer said, and this was a person that does not even believe in God. Said, you'll make more money. Walking down the street, picking up the dollar bills, the coins, the quarters, then you'll make in the long run fooling with the lotto. Well, I know people that's made 10 million. Young, look at them. They don't know where to get the money, and their life is splashed in a million different directions. They can't handle the money. They can't handle the sin factor. They can't pay the bills on the house and the new car. And I mean, their life is blown to a million pieces. You know why? We are made to work. The Bible says a real man does something, he makes his living from what? The sweat of his brow. That's, you think God's going to change for our culture? Not in a million years. And think of the money that them little old, uh, girls is coming there. I mean, the granny's coming there. I, I mean, the little old guy is older than I am. He's hobbling in there the other day right in front of me. I was going to pay. Now, don't be laughing. <clears throat> He's getting along like this. He comes in there and he looks at the waiter and he says, I want that right there. And so he buys, takes his cash money and buys a scratch off. I said, oh, oh, baby, I'd love to help you. Please don't spend that money there. You ain't going to make no money doing that. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, one time I made $150. How much did you spend? Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. You, you, keep your, you keep your tab. You, you're going to, yeah. You know what Noah said? Don't need no scratch off. I'm hooked to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. My uncle, the first, when it first come out in all subs there in post, he said, a boy, come, he called his name, I don't remember the guy's name, but Ted said, he come out of there, he was so happy, he said, I was the first, first one he saw when he come out, he said, hey, Ted, I just won $50. <laughs> Scratching off, he, he said, okay, he said, how much did you spend? He said, 75 <laughs> You didn't win fifty dollars. You lost twenty five. Oh no! I, no. Oh, let, let me tell you. You can't gamble with this world and win. What we owe is Jesus. Run to Jesus. Hallelujah! If you want to put a real gamble out there, pay your tithes and watch God bless you. He said, "Give and it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and run over. Not lotto. You put it in with God. He's going to help you." I love when you shout. Now, I'm just talking about participation. If you're going to make a covenant with God, you've got to stand your ground according to the word of God. <clears throat> he's out of touch with the world, but he's headed to fulfill the call of God. If it takes 100 years, he's going to do it, and he's still driving nails. Woo! I think he just barely got the door on the thing, and the Lord said, get in there. <laughs> Wow, it's time. My friends, did you know the Bible says in a moment in the twinkling of the night, Jesus is coming back. The moment that the father stands up and says, son, go get your bride. Just like that, in a moment in the twinkling of the night, the church is going out of here. And you say, well, it probably won't happen in my time. Well, you're going to die one of these days. You might die tomorrow. So might I. And so knowing that, why would we hedge? on a bet like that and miss heaven for eternity. I mean, live every day walking with Jesus, being proud, celebrate Jesus' name, thank him for saving you, sing those wonderful songs when we all get to heaven. There's gonna be, yes, shouting on the hills of glory. It'll be wonderful. In Matthew chapter seven and verse number 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and look at this word. What did Noah do? He did everything the Lord said. And doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Have you got your hammer with you? <laughs> yeah, and your nails. Wow. Look at verse number 25. <clears throat> and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And notice these words. It fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. <clears throat> And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Friends, when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a world astounded. When the ark started floating, there's people everywhere that won't so now. But guess what? They came one day too late. 
Get ready now while there's opportunity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 4, it talks about the foundation. <clears throat> For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. So we don't build on human people. We build on the things of the Lord. It's not about our denomination. I started preaching in the jail in 1979. This is what I heard all the time. I'm Methodist. I'm free Pentecost. I'm Catholic. I'm Church of Christ. I'm on, on and on. Our, our, no affiliation. I mean, all, all kinds of stuff. And I said, well, what are you doing in jail? <laughs> <laughs> they're like well I made a mistake <laughs> I said well that's what I want to talk to you about then right there <laughs> it's not about the denomination it's about the lordship of Jesus and who hasn't had failure I don't want to be some holy Joe but what I must say friends that what Noah did he made a covenant with God for his family and you couldn't back him out of it yeah. It was as though it had been indelibly written upon that man's heart. We're going to keep driving nails till we get this booger built. And then we're getting in there. Don't you know they made fun of him? It, he didn't build it on a lake or on the side of the ocean. He's just out there in the open. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11. <clears throat> Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. You can call all the names in the world, and friends, none of them can save you. And the devil's not as scared of the assemblies of God. That's the, that's, that's the fellowship that we're in. They can't save you at their best, not one of them. If you got every assemblies of God church in, in the United States and around the world together, they have no power to save. The power to save is in Jesus Christ. So build your ark in him and say our safety zone is there. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 9. <clears throat> Let's see if that's for, yes. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For labor and how often? Wouldn't it neat when they turned the generator on, put the light bulbs in, said, we got to work on this thing night and day. We're getting close to the... I like that, don't you? Labor night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of God. Did you know the Bible talks about Noah being a preacher of the gospel? And for that 100, 120 years, he's telling people about this ark is going to float one of these days. Get your family, get on here with the rest of us and let's go together. It's going to happen. And just as sure... <clears throat> As we're breathing air here in this service this evening, it did come to pass. I thought it was quite interesting. I heard on a documentary just not a long time ago that when they found the ark, quote, that's what I understood it to say, they found some nails in the ark made out of tungsten steel. I thought that was, that was amazing. And uh, I just thought... They meant for that thing to stay together <laughs> through the storm. Isn't that amazing? So, I mean, there was labor, labor, labor. This means, did you know this is Labor Day? <laughs> they're, they're working like crazy. They're, they're building that ark, getting ready. You know, wherever you are in your family, if your family's not even saved, just start walking with Christ. And start believing God for them and claiming them. If your husband's not saved, believe God for them. If your wife is not saved, begin to pray and say, God, I don't want to just go through life and do something and end up in the grave and miss heaven for eternity or my family miss heaven. Let me, let me bring them in. God, they're here because of me. Let, me. let me pour into their life in such a way that they will be changed by the touch of God. There's a second thought. I thought you, hey, I know. Okay. <laughs> Wickedness is at an all-time high. It did not hamper God's ability to save. Amen. Boy, that is so incredible. There's still going to be a church when Jesus comes. And Jesus said he's the builder. He said, I will build my church. And guess what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If everybody you know 
is doing the wrong thing. If they've come like Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not going to change what this book says. There's still going to be a people that lives for God, that gets right, that does what they know is right, that's got some spiritual balance in their mind that I am going to live, I'm going to live for God. In verse number five, God saw the wickedness of the men that it was great in the earth. Every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. If you look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 37, the Lord said in the last days, that's the days that we're living in right now, today, the third day of September, 2023. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When I was growing up, the word divorce was hardly ever used. I saw people that had all kinds of struggle in their family that would not divorce because they had made a vow. They had a covenant with God and the covenant was for for better or for worse until death doeth part. And now how often is divorce spoken of and looked at? And listen, if you've been divorced, I'm not against you. I'm just saying there's a better way. God started it in the beginning. And what happens, if you really stand to your covenant, you work stuff out instead of getting mad and having a pride attack. And and you've got silence and you can't talk no more because they hurt your feelings. Friends, listen. God says they twain become one flesh. Work that thing out and kick the devil out of your life. What you're really fighting is the devil. Yes. Yes. And listen, what your covenant is worth fighting for. You said it, you stand to it and say, God, help me. And I, I know if you look around the world, we'll say, hey, it don't make no difference. I can't tell you the people I've talked to. They said, we can't help it. I said, you can help it. Don't, don't give up. Let God. And you know what? When the Lord steps in, the impossible becomes possible by the grace of God. I mean, it was real uncommon when I was growing up for people to live together without marriage did you know the boys in the jail today told me that that they knew better than living outside of marriage I asked one of them today I said do you know what celibacy is and he said that's a word they don't talk about no more and another one said that means no sex that's not what it means Celibacy means no sex except with your wife. Now, if you're married, come on now. Don't get crazy on me. Yeah. It don't mean with everybody else. Yeah. If you're not married, you wait until you're married. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. One of the other boys, he said, okay, I can't tell you. You can't say it. I'm talking about covenant with God for your family. How important is your family? What kind of seed are you sowing into your family, into your children, into your grandchildren? Make a covenant that God help me bring them under the canopy of the Lord. I don't want to beat people up or say there's no hope for you, friends. I want you to run to Calvary and the meanest, sorriest, wrecked out his life, just like Brother Freeman talking about. When you get to Jesus, he makes you a brand new creature. Wow. I was preaching about two Sundays ago and I was talking about, we was reading those scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. They were reading them to me. The people that does this cannot go to heaven. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality. I mean, it goes right down the list. And uh, I looked over at one of those boys, a nice looking Spanish boy. I said, you've been committing adultery? He goes, ah! <laughs> I said last week you said you was going to live for God I said what are you going to do when you get out are you going to keep sleeping around he said I'm going to go home to my wife I said hey that's a good decision yes now friend listen you can whip the devil if you want to whip him take the word of God with you and say Lord I stepped off the road I need some help and guess what the Lord he comes right to our rescue this writer says that wickedness is out there it's an all time high it did not hamper God's ability to save and friends he's still saving people to the uttermost here in Matthew 24 and 37 it says but as the days of Noah were so shall also the coming of the son of man and be. So it was wicked then. It's going to be wicked when Jesus returns. For as in the days that were before the flood, 
They were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Did they go to heaven? Not according to Scripture. Just the ones that got on the ark, the ones that held the covenant, the ones that wouldn't give no ground. Friends, today our world says every road leads to heaven. The only road that leads to heaven is the one called Jesus Christ. He's the one that paved the way with his blood and he expects us to hold our side. Why didn't Noah just build half of an ark and say, you know what, I just got tired. I just don't want to do it no more. I'm not going back to church. Or you know what, nobody's coming but my own family. I'm not going to keep preaching. Why didn't he? Now, as wicked as the world was, it didn't stop God from saving that man's family. And because of his covenant with God, he just wouldn't give up. We're going to do this in the name of Jesus. And they got it. Woo! They put it together by the grace of God and the glory of the Lord spoke into his life. <clears throat> the family and God is the stability of the nation. If you destroy the family, you destroy the nation. Look at our world. Our world is leaking. Our world today is going septic. Not many people come back from that. Did you know not one nation that ever got in bed with homosexuality ever got out of it? Not one nation. That was the fall of the Grecians. That was the fall of the Romans. You, you watch it go down over and over and over. When they went that far, there's just a nosedive until God brought judgment on them. Friends, I, I don't want to be a calamity howler. I want you to go to heaven and get things right with God. Keep them like they're supposed to be. There's control available. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, Here's the hope we have whenever the devil is trying to get our goat. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what? Mighty, Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And let me tell you, he's got a stronghold. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And notice these words, bringing into captivity. How many thoughts? Yes. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Can you imagine being rejected for a hundred years? When people won't hear what you've got to say in Noah, he just kept right on. He loved the people. You don't, hear, you don't hear meanness coming from that man. He wanted them to get on the ark so bad he left the door open as long as he could and never gave up. Wow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 9, here's the hope that we have in Christ when we hang on to him. And he said unto me, my grace is what? It's sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In Romans 5 and 20, he talks about where sin did abound, my grace doth much more abound. The availability of the power of God to work in your life is still there. It's still available. Salvation is not some mere fascination. We have a covenant with our Savior to follow him until he calls us home and he's going to keep his side of it. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9 <clears throat> the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of what? Temptation. temptation. The only way the devil can get to you or me is through temptation. But guess what? The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation to keep us. The third thing, I'll be closing with this in just a little bit, that not only participation is required, wickedness is at an all-time high, but it does not stop God's ability to save. And thirdly, we can be partakers of the promise. In chapter 7 and verse number 11 of Genesis, thank you, Sister Leatherwood, for reading my mind. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 
night. In the self same day entered Noah and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. God didn't just save Noah. He didn't just save Noah's wife. He didn't just save the boys. He got the families. He put them together. God ordained the family from the beginning. He made a covenant with this family and he rebuilt the entire human populace from these families right here. We are kin to Adam, but we're kin to them folks right there too. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Yes. Powerful. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 7. Talking about being partakers of the promise. He was a partaker because when God said load up, he got in. Wow. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Moved with fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. We would do no injustice to say he got ready and his children made it with him because of his covenant with God. By the which he condemned the world. The rest of them that didn't get on, they went to hell and became heir of the righteousness which is how? By faith. His belief system is what carried him into the ark. He just believed God. It wasn't raining then. I mean, he goes on there dry as all get out. The door is shut, sealed by the Holy Ghost, and then boom, thunder. And all of a sudden, the earth starts quaking. The foundations of all the floods is turned loose from under the earth, and that old ark starts moving around, and people's trying to beat their way into that ark. Woo! He can't open the door. It's three stories high. Wow. The Lord said, just like it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Lord be. It's going to be just like that. So take this time as a moment that God is waiting. That's where we're at right now. We're in the waiting time. Why not? Why not get everything ready? I mean, to the uttermost, Lord. We want to dot the I, cross the T, get all of our children under the wings of God, uh, get our husbands saved, our wives saved, get our uncles and aunts, uh, drag some of them in there and say, <laughs> come on in here. Let God, let God touch you. Look at this scripture in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 20. It's talking about Noah. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God we're talking about 100, 100 years, 120 years. Waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. And here is the heartbreak. Wherein? Can you read that word? Few. Few. If you counted how many actually got on the ark? Eight people. Wherein few. That is, eight souls were saved by water. Nobody else was saved because nobody else believed. And friends, if we go to heaven, if I go to heaven, my belief system must be strong enough that I recognize I've got me a covenant. I've got my word at hand. I've made a covenant with God. I've made a covenant with my wife. I've made a covenant with my children. I want them to go to heaven. So help me God, Lord, help me somehow get that done and believe. That we can bring our family. The family's under siege. But Lord we're believing you to bring them in. To the righteousness of Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5. During this waiting time. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. He spared not the old world. But saved Noah. Now, friends, here all he's saying that there's nobody saved but no. Do you hear that? What he's saying? Spared not the old world. He didn't spare them because they wouldn't get on the ark. He said, "Okay, your cho- you made a choice. I can't make you go." He's not going to make nobody go to heaven. If you and I go to heaven, it's because of our covenant. We've kept it up to date. If they catch you driving without license, they'll give you a ticket. Yes. You got to keep it up to date. Our walk is the same way. I got married a long time ago. How long ago, woman? She yeah, can't remember. But you know, to still have communication, she's got to be nice to me. <laughs> 
Well, she don't have to be, but we kind of made a covenant between us. We'll be nice to each other. Because I found out that the Bible says, whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. So if you're always snotty, guess what? Nana, nana, nana is coming right back to you. So be real tender. Sometimes you got to say you're sorry when you don't even mean it. And then you got to pray through for lying. God, I got to make this work. Help me. I'm talking about the real world. Why not bend over backers to get your thing fixed and say, my family, my family, would you say it with me? My family is going to heaven, so help me God. And I want to be the instigator. Woo! Lord, help me get them there by praying, trusting God for it. Spare not the old world, but save Noah the eighth person, a a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood upon the world of who? The ungodly. You think the ungodly go to heaven? Not in this Bible. And friends, I've been on the ungodly side myself. I don't want to stand up here like some holy Joe. I know what it is to be lost so terribly. But if you live for God, if you love him, you live for him because you love him. Nobody got to beat you up to get you to follow Jesus. They got to knock you out to keep you out of the church house. Come on now. Where is that drive? It says, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. Woo! I used to wear a pickup out going to the dance hall. That's over. I'm going to the house of God now. Glory. What rejoicing when you follow Jesus. In Genesis chapter 8, we're closing with these scriptures. You can stand together. And I can tell you, you stood all you can handle. I sure would love for your family. Dad, wouldn't it be nice when you step at the portals of glory and there comes your wife? And there comes your little girl? And there comes your son? And there come your grandkids? Can you imagine what it's going to be like to see that little old baby girl come in there? That's going to be important. Yeah. Man, I sent a picture to me and Paisley was texting <clears throat> this evening, and I sent a picture to her of, of her mother and her when, they, when she was just a little, little, pretty little girl. Connie, I mean, Mama found it. My mother found it the other day, a real pretty picture, and I took a photograph of it on my phone and sent it in a text to her. And I, and I was telling her, we was just loving on each other. I said, these are my babies. She said, they sure are good looking. <laughs> of course, little old Jess, she's been dead for several years. What, 11 years? 12? About 12, 13 years, 12. I think she's died in 11. Anyway, one of these days, I'm going to step in through them gates. And I'm going to look that little blue-eyed girl in the eye and say, baby, you got, you got ahead of me, but I'm a coming Whoa, that old song says, what rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise. When the saints shall rise. We're headed for that jubilee over yonder in the skies. Oh, what singing. Oh, what shouting on that happy morn. And when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory. Hallelujah. When we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. The problem with the end time message is nobody preaches that Jesus is coming. The world has got so wallered out and so busy that the world, the church world, has turned to entertaining people instead of saying, get ready because Jesus is coming. We got a man right here and a woman that could have died just a week ago, a, a, a semi-truck run over the little old car. <clears throat> it would have been just as easy, Brother Freeman, for you to have been dead today as not. You think it's not important? We have no promise from that Bible of tomorrow. And so I beg you, step up to the plate and say, God, I'm making a covenant with you right now. Maybe half of your children don't even know Jesus. Or maybe your mate doesn't. But what about saying, I'm just going to go to praying for them and loving on them. And drawing my hands around them and bringing them to the things of God. Because when, 
when I leave here, I want my family to go with me. How many this evening has got family that needs to be saved? I see them hands going up all over this building. Would you come to these altars tonight and say, God, if you'll make a covenant with Moses or Noah, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. What about me? I want to make my covenant with you. And I'm, I'm covenanting for my family. I'm ready to put my work clothes on. I'm going to pray. I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to watch my family come to Christ.